waiting for the ship to, to dock so they can uh, they can seize something. Right, right. So um, so it's a very interesting situation. Now I think what'll have to happen is they'll have to get some temporary bailout or some temporary relief, some guarantees either from governments um, uh, or for other organizations uh, that may be interested in acquiring some of their assets to relieve the situation so those goods can get unloaded. I don't know what, what you think, Chris. No, I, I, you're much more informed on it. I, I, what I had read is that uh, uh, they, Hanjin was scared about entering some ports because they were worried about the creditors would claim their goods. But I know I've read that uh, it's about $14 billion in freight that's out there, and this is a, a bad time because a lot of finished goods distribution is coming in right before the um, push for Christmas. This is the time when a lot of stuff's coming in, so it's going to have ripple effects. And so the question, if you're a, a Samsung or a Walmart, right, and you have something on that ship, do you reorder double? Do you bring other stuff in and fly that in? Do you try to recover? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you can pivot. I know there's some that are in port. I was just reading this this morning. Some ships that are in the port, they don't want them to leave now because they're afraid they're going to go to a third, a different port where they don't have extradition rights. They have, they don't oh, have I some see. of those privileges, so they I want see. to keep them where they are now. So it's, it's an interesting situation. It will continually evolve. And what's interesting, in week five and six, you'll talk about this even more. Yeah, we'll talk about the steamship industry, yeah, yeah. its ups and downs, and how it works in the bullwhip effect. It's, a lot, it's actually an interesting and fun industry to watch because there's so much going on in it all the time. It's crazy. Yeah. Right. So speaking of the bullwhip effect, are you aware of any recent examples of a company attempting to mitigate the bullwhip effect? Yeah. How successful was the initiative, and what are the lessons learned? So I think there's debate now about how much the bullwhip effect actually hits different companies because there's been such uh, advances in, the, in a lot of technology and communication. Because I think as what Bruce was saying earlier, communication is at the root of a lot of the problems. And so use of point-of-sale data or more frequently updated point-of-sale data in most retail chains has really mitigated a lot of this. Um, so I've seen for some uh, fast-moving consumer good companies where they've not totally eliminated it, but they've reduced it significantly because they have better information not from the, the retailer's DCs but from the retailer's stores. And so as they get that, they can get some advance notice. Um, so I don't think they're as shocked anymore. However, some of the drivers are still there. Um, the, you know, the minimum order quantities that drive batching of trucks and the batching of, of manufacturing still is there. Although, interestingly, um, Procter & Gamble, for example, has moved to these mixing centers where instead of uh, a retailer requiring a full <coughs> truckload of, right. of Pampers, for example, now they can have a mixed full truckload of multiple items. So what that does naturally is it reduces that batch size much smaller as you reduce the batch size, you can have more frequent delivery. So instead of requiring a full truckload of six different product lines, you can have more frequent shipments of one full truckload of those six um, products or categories together. So that's something that they've done that has really reduced the amount of batching, which in turn reduces that amplitude uh, problem of, of uh, bullwhip. Yeah, just another comment. Um, uh, a lot of companies... Um, so when when the stock market crashes, it crashes. At, you know, two thousand one, two thousand eight. Um, there's a need to to reduce your cost structure as fast as you can. Typically, your customers can reduce your your revenue stream a lot faster than you can reduce your cost structure. And so, having much more of a variable cost cost structure gives you a huge advantage. And there's a number of companies that that do a lot of outsourcing, and and purchasing materials and so forth on a variable cost basis. It, you know, if you own the factory and you own all the employees, um, it's very slow for you to respond when the economy crashes, right? If, if things are contracted out on a variable cost basis, then you can bring your uh, expenses down much faster. And, um, and so you can minimize the impact of, of the ups and downs in the economy because you can respond more quickly and have less risk at that. Well, Bruce, isn't that harder to convince in good times? Because you're paying more. For that contract, right? You're not going to be paying less than if you owned the whole thing. So it's not necessarily a low cost when it's blue skies and everything's great. Well, you know, the, I didn't say this the first time, but uh, almost all bad decisions are made in good times. And it's very hard to convince um, in a senior management that uh, you need to, to do business practices differently because when the crash happens, mm -hmm. you have to be able to respond, you have to be able to reduce your costs. You have to be able to cancel in incoming orders. Uh, you need to be able to um, um, 
the, the, so cash be, cash is king when when the economy goes south. Right. And being able to respond quickly is a way to, to hold on to your cash and, and, and respond. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, great. Uh, so here's a question from Vikas. He says, uh, when developing processes with external stakeholders, like 3PLs, transporters, etc., what are the watchouts? What do you look for? And how do you dictate expectations in advance? For a third party, so, so, so someone is not in your organization. Well, one, one of the things that, that I always suggest is um, you, you have to have those other players, the, the third parties, share the same sense of urgency around performance in your supply chain that you have, right? And that's often a problem where you're working really hard and, and they're not essentially uh, as, as dedicated and bought in. They're not working over the weekend. They're not keeping their employees late at night while you are, and there's a, there's a big mismatch there. So having a, um, a supplier scorecard, um, a supplier scorecard is, is a relatively simple thing to do, but the scorecard has a tremendous amount of power. When you submit a, a scorecard, even to an organization much larger than you, mm -hmm. that scorecard has a life of its own inside that organization, and it goes up the chain of command, and senior management sees how well they're performing. Now, it may be that you're a relatively small customer, but they're still getting feedback from you that, that actually has more importance than, than maybe it even should have, but it's a great way uh, to keep those suppliers uh, performing well. Give them a scorecard. That's, so what's interesting, I found it a slightly different effect. When I go out and work with companies, it's easier for a lot of companies to work with third parties because it's a contractual relationship The gives and the gets are well established as opposed to working with someone who doesn't report to me they're kind of they think they're doing me a favor you know that's right that's so you right. work with a company where uh, for example large retailers many retailers uh, will have a private fleet and third party a lot of times they'd rather work with the carriers the third party carriers because they know what they get you know you hold a big hammer over them yeah. the fleet you don't control and so it's it's a different set of skills, and sometimes the gives and the gets are more well established um, with a third party. And we did a project with BASF several years ago where we helped them define their supply chain strategy because, like with many large companies, I think they have 72 separate business units, and everyone had a, it was his own P&L. And so, how do you establish a supply chain structure that works for that? And they almost had to act as a third party, and they had a contractual agreement: the gives and the gets for each one of the P&Ls, custom to them, but the only way they could make it work was to clearly define it. So, yeah, it's, it's a different set of challenges. Yeah. Right. So here's a question for you, Chris. I'm sure you're going to enjoy answering this one. Yes. It's from uh, one of our CTAs. Oh, hold on. Alan. Hold on. We're broke. Good. Uh -oh. What's <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're so, open again. <laughs> all right. I can't read. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. No, you can read. We're up? Yep. All, all right, right, we're back. So. Um, <laughs> Question from one of our CTAs, Alan or Elaine. He asks, with Uber beginning testing of driverless cars this week, mm -hmm. what are the implications for the trucking industry? Specifically, will this allow significant improvements in coordination of deliveries to other business processes? So there's a couple different things. There's this whole Uberization of freight versus autonomous trucks. So let's separate the two. Um, Uberization of freight is really a misnomer. Um, right now, what, what the passenger transportation market is undergoing is what the trucking industry changed in the U.S. in 1980. It's really the brokerage, brokerageization of passenger freight. So we've gone through that. Now, as far as autonomous trucks, that's huge. And it's actually been happening in places. Um, and, and so if you can look at it in two different areas, where it's applied and how it's applied. And it's a, it's a, it's a continuum. It's not like suddenly robots driving, no pure humans. You're seeing more automation, safety, you know, enhancements that are making it much more automated along the lines, and you're seeing it used in contained areas first. A lot of railroads are really leading in this in their yards. You're seeing more of it. Um, I think eventually it will change dramatically. I've made the, the claim in a bunch of talks I've given that in probably 30 years, our kids' kids, is that about what it is going to be? Kids, 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 will be shocked that we drove our own cars. It's going to become like a, thinking back to when's the last generation that rode horses and had horse and buggies. It's going to be like, oh, I can't imagine that. Um, it will change trucking, I think, because then all the hours of service laws go out. Uh, delivery gets a lot easier. But I, I think we're a good 10 to 15. But I mean, they're trying it in Pittsburgh, but, you know, they do anything in Pittsburgh. Oh, come on now. Um, except play football. <laughs> <laughs> we won by 22 points, that's right. 
uh, what, what's interesting is you see it, it, it coming in gradually, like lane assist. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, you drift. You know, you're driving, but you start to drift off the lane. The car tries to, to put you back in the lane. Um, the automatic braking that's happening if yeah, you, you know. you're not paying attention. So, the, so more and more of these sensors are coming into our existing cars. Yeah. And um, and it'd be interesting. I, I saw the the article in Pittsburgh. You know, the, uh, driverless Uber Ubers were taking people around. Yeah, and you know the hype is leading the actuality. Sure. It's four cars right now, if, I, if I'm correct. They have more ready to go, and it's a really contained area. Yeah. It's still not. They're working out kinks, and so I don't think we'll see 53 foot over the road trucks going without anyone in them anytime soon. But I think we'll start seeing platooning, especially in, in uh, anyone in Australia. We'll see it out there. I think they're already doing it to some degree, where you have a human in the front, maybe a human in the back, and it makes it a little easier. I think um, the technology is advancing faster than the social acceptance and the regulations. And that's why they're trying it in, in Pittsburgh. They're trying to do it before any laws have a chance to get written, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting. It's an it's a interesting area. It'll have a long-term effect. I don't see the short term yet. A lot of people are trying different things. Right. Um, so it's 10.57 now. One last question. One last question. You have a good one? Okay. A BPR is mainly a cultural change project. You take, or have you taken into business account business process redesign? Okay. Or re engineering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You take on, or have you taken into account culture during these projects? Well, we're out of time. We can't. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, you want to answer that? No, it, it's it's a big part of it. It's a very human experience, uh, business process reengineering, and you you bring the, the parties in the room, and they interact with each other. And you you do have uh, you have engineers that come in the room. You have people who are, uh, you know in finance and, and sales and so forth, and different different personalities, and they have to learn to work together. Uh, and that's part of the process of, of having them meet each other, learn to work with each other, and, um, and, they sh and of course if you have an international corporation that has people in different countries of the world, they have a different appreciation of what time means, when on time means, or when meeting starts and so sure. forth, um, and they have different appreciations of risk. Uh, not all countries think about risk the same way we do. So there's a lot of, a lot of blending of, of ideas that has to happen to make processes successful. But do you find that the, the corporate culture dominates the local culture, geography, or the other way around? Um, does P&G behave the same in Latin America and yeah. India, or does the, the local culture dominate? I think the corporate culture would like to think that it, but I don't <laughs> think that's, that's true. I think that to be smart, you have to uh, yeah. adapt it to the local culture because that's after the, the guy from headquarters goes back home, the people who are still there doing the work are from that culture and it has to work in that culture. So the processes yeah. will be consistent across cultures but will be executed differently? Have you seen that? Yeah. yeah. And in fact, as some companies, uh, L'Oreal yeah. was one of the companies that identified multicultural people, people who like spent part of their childhood in one country part of their childhood in another country, so they grew up having multiple home countries. Those people were actually very good uh, at working at a corporate job and trying to get different organizations. They're more w willing to accept ideas and, and uh, ways of doing things uh, in different parts of the world. Great. Yeah. All, right. All right, so I think we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you, Bruce. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. I apologize for the technology. We're trying a new platform, so we'll continue to make this a little better. I think our next Hangout Eva, do you know? It's coming up. We'll announce it. It'll be on supply chain strategy. It'll be after the midterm. That will, we'll be with Dr. Roberto Perez Franco. And so I hope you're looking forward to that one. We'll leave the chat open. We'll leave the chat open for about an hour or two, and then uh, we'll close it down. Thanks, guys.